Hey everybody, I want to talk about a product and platform that I absolutely love and our latest sponsor, Interseller, the prospecting and outreach platform of choice for recruiters and sellers. Whether you're doubling down on business development or recruiting talent, Interseller does all the heavy lifting of finding contact data, automating the email and follow-up process, and syncs all that rich data into 20 plus CRM and ATS platforms. Reach out now and get going on a two-week free trial and let them know you heard about it from Adam on the podcast today. Check out the link on the website. Appreciate it. Welcome to the podcast, where we introduce you to incredible humans who share their journeys with the mission to inspire you to harness your own inner tenacity to drive your life and career forward. And now, your host, Adam Posner. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast where I bring you the best and the brightest in the world of business, marketing, and entrepreneurship to help you harness your inner tenacity and drive your career forward. Folks, my guest today, Kathleen Griffith, is the owner of female-focused marketing consultancy, Grace & Co., where her ultimate passion is to help female entrepreneurs start their own companies and architect their life the life of their dreams. In the past five years alone, Kathleen has directed over half a billion, damn, uh, marketing dollars with clients ranging from Nike to Verizon to NBC Sports. And she's an expert in marketing to the female consumer and is helping larger brands communicate with women in a more meaningful way. We're going to dig into all that. And she also serves on the executive committee of the cons, cons, how do you say cons? Everyone kind of laughs about that. Lion, see, see it, be it which fosters the advancement of female creative talent. Super cool. She's also the founder of Build It Like a Woman, a global platform providing inspiration, tools, and community for women to rise and thrive in all aspects of their business and lives. So I'm done talking. Let's get to it. She has a ton of wisdom and insights to share, so I'm excited to unpack her journey and a lot more. Kathleen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. You nailed it. I nailed it. I love it. I nailed your name. I got it. We're good to go. So, you know, we were talking earlier and, um, you know, I love connecting with folks in the same industry and, you know, somewhat parallel, similar career journeys that I've had and, and all the directions they go. I started in Adland myself, you know, 15 years working in advertising and marketing. And so did you. So I always love to ask, let's hit the rewind button here. And, you know, if you go back to your, you know, your, your college days or maybe even, maybe even before, what was that kind of itch, thought, motivation to want to be working in advertising and marketing? For me, I was a born entrepreneur. I don't really believe it's something that can be taught. I was selling candy and I think candy arbitrage. I was actually talking to Mark Randolph, who's one of the co-founders of Netflix. And he said, it's one of the greatest indicators that you're a born entrepreneur is if you're into hacking candy, like this idea that you can, and, and my whole bit was the snack attack pack, which was candy, overpriced snacks. I would like hack them on the school um, loudspeaker in the morning and sell it for more than I bought it. So, so business for me has always been my play. It's my creative kind of art form. I played business growing up. That was my favorite thing to have people over and, you know, hold my calls. <laughs> I'm on the other <laughs> line. And then, yeah, all of that. So I loved it. Um, I think as I got older, you know, I came from a super risk averse family. Lifers, 30 years, 35 years, right. you're loyal, same you company, leave, same company. Uh, I could not find an entrepreneur in the family tree to save my life. And so I went the more traditional expected route. I went and did what I thought I was supposed to do, which I think so many people can relate to that. You walk the path that is pretty much prescribed by you, for you, by other people that you would never have chosen for yourself in your life. And my first job, I did a um, major in communications at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Go Heels. And my first job was what I could find on monster.com right. in the communications. <laughs> what do I do with a comm degree? Like you, ex- you know, existed and were able to kind of help place people. And I was an assistant to the assistant of the assistants oh, at man. Deutsch Advertising making, for Donnie Deutsch. Making probably about $26,000 a year back then. Yeah, right? 28 yep. five, Yeah, exactly. Uh, time and a half if you work past nine, oh, my which God. I really took it's, advantage of. I was the queen. You're going to milk it. The late night, the late night, meal, the late shift, the time and a half, 
dials. If I stay the, past the eight, I could get a, are. I could get, remember this dial sevens and you had the vouchers and everything. Oh yeah. That was classic. But a couple of quick funny things here that I never really spoke about. Um, so when I was in middle school and growing up in Brooklyn and my, my parents reminded me of this a few weeks ago that I, I was part of this group called the, the, the pretzel squad where we sold pretzels during lunch. And I remember I would kind of like siphon off a couple of pretzels that maybe fell on the floor, so to speak. And I like sell them like black market pretzels. It was it was crazy. But you're funny about the, the candy thing. And as so many people I spoke to have that similar story, so many entrepreneurs of, you know, you know, getting the bulk candy and then selling it at school. I mean, that's the, the, the core of of entrepreneurship. And the third thing, which which I found really interesting. Both my parents, New York City Board of Ed teachers, 30 years, and we'll talk about your grandmother, um, who Grace is named after. Uh, she was a teacher for many years. Um, my brother's in education, too, and I was kind of the, you know, the black sheep who wasn't going into education, and also with a comm degree. And what do you kind of do with it? But you kind of go into advertising and marketing here in New York. So, you know, the early days. Um, but Adam, you're doing it now. You're teaching I know. now. You're teaching now. That, right? Yeah, of course. And that's just the way it works. So, you know, you go back to Adland. Adland in New York City. I mean, I'm not trying to, to date yourself or date myself here, but, you know, we're talking 15, 20 years ago. It was a much different place. It was night and day different. And, you know, you paid your dues and you did the work. But what was one of those early lessons, Kathleen, you remember from those early, you know, you know, first, you know, five, seven years in, in Adland that you're like, oh, I can't believe I went through this. But you know what? Looking back right now, I, I apply those lessons every day now. 10,000 hours. You've got to get 10,000 hours in something. I don't care what it is, but I think, you know, the, the, those days, it was all about just putting in the work and putting in the hours. It was 80 hours, a hundred hours, so many hours, the, the, the closest analog in New York city at the time was working in finance, right? Like exactly. I worked banker hours. I worked Goldman Sachs hours. I slept under my desk. I slept on park bench outside because I was falling asleep <laughs> at my desk hours. And I think like, once you have that, you can fan out. I'm a big believer in jungle gym, your life. And you like should that. be all over over the place, doing everything, trying everything that speaks to you, even if there's no linear through line. But before you do that, and I see so many young people jumping and darting way too fast, get 10,000 hours in something to your subject matter expert. Yes. Because once you have that, it's like a degree. And if you don't have the luxury of going to college, which that's a whole other conversation. I don't whole know the podcast. I recommend that. But if you don't have the luxury of that, you ha- it's like having a degree that no one can ever take away from you. Never, ever, ever. Like you're putting that on the board. No one can ever, no one ever can ever take that away from you. So no, that's what that taught me. Ab- absolutely not. And, and it's such an important topic. And let's go off script here for a moment because I'd love to get your thoughts. You know, I, my ears to the ground and eyes to the ground from the perspective of being a recruiter. And I, and I see these young job seekers. I don't know if it's, in my opinion, you know, are they making mistakes? To your point, they're not jungle gymming it. They're jumping around too much or they're expecting, you know, promotions or certain results in a shorter amount of time. Is it a change in culture? Are we just getting old, sadly? We still look good, but are we getting old, Kathleen? Or is it, you know, or, or is there a, a, a critical failure happening with early mentorship where they're either not getting it, they're not seeing role models, and they're not seeing good examples of how to put in the time, how to learn, how to, you know, find a mentor and, and really learn a craft or skill? I mean, what are you seeing out there? Am I crazy just thinking this? I think it's, yeah. I mean, I, look, I think it's, it's lazy thinking to say it's just this generation. I mean, this generation yeah, it's not is fair. hungry. And yeah, they, of course. Are, they are voracious consumers of information, knowledge, education. They have so many interests. They're like the ultimate slashers. To me, it's a failure from a corporate side of we don't have people really leading and reaching down in the way that they also used to. They used to. When we were coming up, there were programs. You know, you were like educated and you went through the paces and it was like being in the military, you know, you were like, you had to earn you, your promotion to account director, or, you know, senior account, forever. exact account soup. Yeah. There was years, it was tenure. Now they throw that shit around like candy. Well, it, it, and it's, there isn't the rigor of the programs because that's been another, you know, cutback. And right. I think the leaders also, you know, we do a horrible job even at a corporate, you know, I work with fortune 100s all the time 
at his senior level in translating mission and vision also. And if you don't have a mission and vision that people can rally around who are younger, they're going to leave because that's, that's all they care about. You know, the paycheck, everything else is secondary to them. But what is your stance? Why do we exist in the world? What are we here for? That's what you really need to provide the young right. people in your companies. Yeah, and, and absolutely. And I feel like one of the real downfalls of what's happening with COVID and the, the pandemic over the last couple of years that um, younger employees and newer employees in an organization are such a disadvantage when working remote because they don't have that opportunity, Kathleen, to see firsthand. It's hard to do it remote. It's hard to see. You know, I remember, I don't know if you remember, like those early, you know, my first five, 10 years sitting in conference rooms with senior creative teams presenting and the, and the account directors, you know, standing up there. And I was like, oh, my God, they're gods and goddesses up there. The way they could articulate and flow and capture the attention of the clients. It was incredible. And I think that, you know, specifically in Adline and a lot of other industries, too, that is a, a big miss right now. There are certain industries I don't believe that can be done remotely and creative and the work that we do creatively. You've got to be in a room. You've got to jam together. You've got to feel that the energy. It's the energy, energy, right? Yeah. And you've got to like, you have to have time and space for that. I, I just, I think it's one of, it, it will be an industry that can never, um, Sad. that can never fully go remote or go digital. <clears throat> And it's and it and it seems kind of you know where some parts of the advertising are becoming almost transactional, and that's that takes a whole art and craft out of it. So you put in your time, obviously, you spent you know number of years at some big agencies, Ogilvy, McGarry, Bowen, before you left to go out on your own. When did you start to feel the confidence and kind of that draw to say, okay, I put my time in here, I'm ready for the next phase of my career to go out on my own? When you left McGarry, I'm of the Damon John school of <laughs> thinking where. You have an exit strategy and you have a plan, but you don't make the leap until you financially can make the leap. And so I knew that I wanted to leave. I, I mean, entrepreneurship was in my bones forever, and I've been denying that forever. That was something that I was wholly aware of. Um, but I really waited to make the leap for at least a year until I was able to land my first client. So I'm just a big believer. Don't make the leap until you have income, predictable income. You've lined that up and build your website, get your LLC, you know, get a lawyer on board, get your first client before you make the leap. And then you're leaping into something that actually has some level of stability. So I actually was so afraid from a non-compete standpoint, working with all these fortune 100s that I got a right. profit as my That's first client. Was that like the dream solution? No, but I knew that eventually I was going to get to where I needed to be. So that's interesting too. I'm completely in alignment with you. And that's kind of what I did to some extent when I, when I went on my own. Um, but I see so many of these like quote unquote gurus out there saying, you know, calling about the great resignation where people are just getting up and leaving during a pandemic. And I think that's pretty awful advice. I think that there's something important to be said about follow your passion. But I think to those points that you just mentioned, the pragmatic strategic approach when it comes to um, having a stable or at least one client, you know, ready to go, having your house in order. What are your thoughts on that of, of balancing the follow your passion versus freaking, hey, do this the right way? I think it's very difficult to, to do anything that is fully passion or creative based when you are also then putting a capital expectation on it. And what I mean by that is to burden your creativity or burden your passion with, I need to monetize this. There's nothing more desperate than that energy going out in market. We feel and it. That was another mistake that I made when I brought on full-time six-figure employees prematurely. I, I felt that they felt that clients that I was pitching felt that there was this energy of, well, I have this huge payroll and I've got to make this work and you've yeah, got to work clients. with me. And the second I let that go, it was transformative for my business because I was there because I wanted to be and for the love of what I do. And I then I was it. able to build something off the back of that. So you know, and now it. money is an enabler, money is an accelerant, you know, I'm all about capitalism. And, um, you know, this is not a passion project. This is like very real business for me. But ultimately, this is your life. I this think it has to be born from that place. And so yeah, business, new businesses are up 82% from pre pandemic rates with the majority of those being actually started 
by women and particular women of color. And I am all for that. I'm also all for that happening out of necessity. You know, a lot of these one in four women were forced to point. downshift her entire career as a result of being laid off due to the pandemic or the responsibilities that she had in the home and uh, from a caregiver perspective. And so, you know, there are also people who are starting these businesses non-electively that, you know, I want to support and, and think about supporting. And I think when you are dealt that hand, then again, that's a very different story. And the question becomes, okay, what am I going to do about this? If even entrepreneurship isn't necessarily in my DNA, right. but this is what the can you do with I've it? been dealt. And I think you can do it. I think I've seen a lot of folks like that who are also very successful because when your back is up against the wall, you're, you, you become pretty undeniable pretty quickly. It, it brings out some different traits. It's interesting you say that because I've been talking about this not enough. And, you know, everyone's kind of throwing around, you know, the, the future is flexible work, which I, I agree with. And I don't think the, the future work to what we were talking about earlier is fully remote. I don't think humans were meant to work in silos. But if we're going to talk about specifically, let's talk about working parents. Everyone talks about working moms and working dads. But let's put, let's put them together into one group here. I think a lot of people who don't realize, and not necessarily if you don't have kids, because I never really fault people who don't have kids for making parental judgments. But when working parents, they have to balance a few things that a lot of people don't think about. Not just their home life with their kids and everything, but they're thinking about their on the job performance. They're competing in their workplace against folks who may not have kids, who may not have to worry about, you know, taking care of them all day long, all around the house. And a lot of people that want to get back to the office because that's where they could focus and be their best, mm. plus have that, plus have that visibility. So I say to everybody who's always saying, work from home forever, I go, that's not the answer for everybody. You have to take it on an individual basis and understand what people are are going through at home and what they have to manage. Because what that's if their right. kids are, their kids are yeah. working, the kids are homeschooling. And they're sitting there. How the heck are they supposed to get their work done? They're trying to jump on Zoom calls. And that's an added stress and pressure. So, you know, I'm a big advocate in just saying, hey, pause for a second before you make these generalizations that, you know, remote work, entire companies. I think it should kind of be a flexible choice. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, look, I don't have kids. Um, I don't I'm not married. I don't have kids. So for me, you know, I'm speaking out of turn to even have a position. But you have a good perspective on it. But you have a very fair perspective because you're a proponent of female entrepreneurship and business. I think you have a huge. I I think, yeah, I think it needs everyone needs to architect. (laughs) The thing I am a big believer in is designing your life and architecting what works for you, irrespective of the context or the surroundings or the expectations that other ha- other people have for you and your life. You know what works for you. You know what works best for you. And so ideally, you are able to manage that on an individual basis and have those honest conversations around what does performance look like for you and how are you going to be most equipped and you have an employer who's receptive to that. That may be in the Tremendous. office, that may be at home, that may be a flexible hybrid solution, um, but that also comes from knowing yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to hit the rewind button and I'd love to talk about, you know, the meaning behind, you know, we spoke offline about how I named my company, but Grace and Co, correct me if I'm wrong, named after your grandmother, who was a mother of five and a K through 12 teacher. What was, what was the most important lesson that your grandmother, you know, embedded with you? Grace under pressure. (laughs) She was, she was the embodiment of her name. I love <laughs> you it. You know, this is someone who could not, she was a frail 90 pound soaking wet, <laughs> little tiny lady in the prairies of Regina, Saskatchewan, middle of nowhere, Canada. And think about that responsibility. You're essentially responsible for educating the entire town, <laughs> every single level, <laughs> it's crazy. which I can't even imagine. And you have these five children that you're also responsible for, you know, rearing and and bringing up in the world. And she just, she, she was under fire, but she never lost um, her grace. You know, she was just a quiet, small, but mighty woman. I love it. Um, And I think that's something I really try to channel. Look, I'm like competing in the greatest arenas with the greatest leaders working for the greatest brands. It's highly competitive. There's a lot of pressure. Oh yeah. There are really high expectations. In terms Stakes of are output high. And throughput. 
Um, but that's really how I, how we, I, I try to lead, you know, how I try to lead teams is, is with grace. And I think, you know, like with your daughter on the really hard days, having a why that is greater than any how or what. And for me, that starts with my grandmother. That starts with all the women who've come before the aunts, the, the grandmothers, um, you know, the cousins, the, the long lineage that I stem from that have made this possible for me in this country to do this. I would never be able to do this in any other time and in a lot of other countries. And so that's something that, that I channel on really hard days. And thank you for joining Kathleen Griffith's TED Talk, everybody. Now, that was fantastic. I love it. That was tremendous here. Um, let's go back to year one. Year one, you're out on your own. You spent a number of years working in, 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 in under and for other people. Now it's year one on your own. What was one of those really tough pills to swallow? Were those big mistakes? I worked, um, I mean, so many right? Like you just, you have a yellow brick road that is paved with mistakes and failures. (laughs) It's called my shit pit. Yeah. Yeah. One learning lesson after the next. Um, I went after really big partnerships really soon without really having, I think like the level of sophistication on how to do deals. And that's always uh, fun. (laughs) I went after a media company that won't be named, you know, named, but I'm sure you could figure them out. I mean, one of the biggest they're, they're just badasses. And, um, it took over a year of resources. Eventually we walked away from the deal. Um, but it took a year of back and forth with lawyers and they had a huge team and fleet and they had corporate comms people. And I just didn't have that bench. And so you, I you don't have those resources way, way over my head. And it, you, you come to understand as an entrepreneur year one, that time is money. And the illusion of progress is not actually progress. And so I like that. that made me feel special that the C- CEO and founder of this huge company was sitting down with me in Brooklyn and wanted us to be his, you know, women led partner. Um, but it didn't materialize. So it was worth nothing. And it was a drain of my time and energy. Yeah. It's always an interesting experience. I mean, I look back on, and I've had, I have some tremendous clients, everything from enterprise level, giant holding ad agency, holding companies to, you know, five person startups and everything in between. And it was, it's always interesting even to this point now where I do have some resources from, you know, a legal financial perspective. But when you step into those conversations, especially in the first couple of years, it's awesome. You're like, Hey, shit, my relationships and my ability and skills got me through the door and a seat at this table. But now we're on the other side. Now we're on the business side of it. And you're like, Oh my God, like contracts, negotiations, legal, like it's, uh, it, it could get a little hairy at times. So I certainly could relate to that one. So, you know, how did you grow past that first client and what does it take to consult, you know, and, and get to that level where you're dealing with the, the relationships with the Nikes of Verizons and the Googles of the world? I fundamentally believe it's an inside job. So the lion's share of where I spend my time and energy is actually in per- personal growth. And you've seen some of this. Like I, I spend a lot of time in personal growth. I was constantly searching business leaders on how to get better and sharper in business. And what I came to find is the personal growth space, at least for me, has been the X factor in my business, meaning radical personal accountability, having a sense of personal agency around what mm-hmm. you're doing. And I think for your listeners, it, in my mind, beyond everything else that we covered, that's where you actually really start to become dangerous in business because I was focused on, I had this list. I actually did a list of the 10 attributes, and this would be a good exercise for people to do who are at home. 10 things that are my super skills in running this business strength, yep. and the 10 things that I hate about myself, right? Like <clears throat> I can't stand and I want to, I want to extract. And there were things like loyalty as a positive and kindness and grace and empathy. And on the negative side, you know, sassy and manipulative and salesy. And, and what I came to find is that I, and I think this is the next phase of business is it's about integration. There were actually things that I was making wrong in myself that are actually really special. Like when I look at that little girl, you know, and you've got a little girl at five or six years old, I was sassy and I was opinionated and I was a disruptor. Like that's how I came out. And then over time, I learned to eliminate those things from my life because 
culture didn't accept it. You know, business didn't accept it. On the flip side, loyal beyond reason. Is that really a good thing? Yeah, <laughs> that, it, it, really it could be. It's a, dub, it's a double-edged sword. I'm me too. I'm, I'm, I'm loyal to a fault sometimes. Not necessarily. Right. So, so that reconciliation process for me has been a game changer in integrating the personal and the professional, having a vision for my total life, and then making these attributes that initially I made at odds with each other now fierce friends. So that's fantastic. Like this, and that's when and, you become amplified. I like, love it. And so I talked about this idea of amplification, but you become amplified in business. You become an unmovable object when you are able to drop into that space where you're bringing your total self, good, bad, and different into that room. That negotiation starts to look very differently. And I can, I can give you an example of what I mean by that. I think that's relevant to your world. Sure. Someone's coming in for a business negotiate, you know, a salary negotiation, for example, instead of just what we all do, right? Like you walk in, what do they give you? What do they say? You walk back out and forth and to sure play the game. How you counsel someone. And then you kind of scurry away and, you know, talk to your, talk to your friends, <laughs> talk, talk to, to your, your parents. Kids. Yep. Like, no, you know, step into that, prime yourself, do your meditation, do your exercise in the morning, figure out your walk away number, figure out your dream number. Mm -hmm. And you walk in and you lead that conversation. It will have an outsized return on your life. I guarantee it. But, but it's incredible how many people step into these sorts of things in a very reactive, non-proactive, you know, sort of way. And I'm and guilty as charged for forever. We, we That's are. I did it for forever. Let's double back and talk about something. And you mentioned you, you listened to my Gary Vee podcast, which I appreciate. And to him, you know, my journey is talking about this radical accountability that when you could finally say, you know what? I'm responsible for my losses. I can't blame them. I'm done blaming them on other people. I am responsible for what I'm good at. I understand what I'm not so good at. And that's what I'm going to focus on. And I think that so many people struggle, struggle with saying, like, I'm going to take ownership of my actions and take ownership of my losses. Uh, so I commend you for calling that out early. How do you mentor others to take that accountability? How would you like, you know, how, you know, if you had a young female entrepreneur sitting in front of you, how would you guide her to, to, to put that into practice. To know thyself, you've just got to spend a lot of time with yourself. And yeah, your feelings and your emotions. And your feelings and not running. Be right? truthful. Like we love to numb and we love to run and we, there it's are easy. a million ways to escape now more than ever. And so that would be really it. It would be pretty simple advice. Like sit in the stillness, you know, sit in the discomfort, watch what's coming up for you. Watch the parts of yourself that you hate and you loathe in yourself. Watch the parts of yourself that feel really unique and special, like superpowers. And I think once you have that personal accountability, you're then able to, what's made me, you know, I think what's made me successful is I run at things that are really unrealistic. And that's how I've been able to get the Nikes of the world or, you Take know, your shot. these incredible opportunities because... I know myself and now all the outside is just, that's just noise. Whether I get it or not, I'm just, I'm good. Yeah. You're, put, you're <laughs> putting, you're putting good. Cause I took that shot and I wanted to take that shot. You're leading, you're leading, you're leading by example. And I, I want to go back to, you know, build like a woman. Um, how, how close have you gotten to the vision that you, you know, initially set out? Not even uh, you know, I'm mile one. <laughs> I'm not even remotely close to being there. And I think that like yeah, let's feel dissatisfaction with, you know, I'm here not to compete with anyone else. I'm here to realize my potential as a human to the greatest extent possible while I'm here. And ideally to support anyone else that wants to do that. Um, and so build is really, build is the first kernel of, you know, many other things, but 50% of women are giving up on their dreams, sitting on these dreams that they've given up on. And when I see what's on the other side of a dream, mm -hmm. you know, you meet the person you're meant to become. And so once you see that, you know, as someone who was working for other people seven years ago, 
once you see what's on the other side of this couldn't life. Couldn't agree with you more. Couldn't right? agree more. Right? You know yeah. it. Like, it's, 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 you can't, you don't know what it's going to be until you do it. Like, I never knew what it was going to be. Like, you and I were meant to not work for other people. You know, I say this all the time, like, to do our own thing, because that was the powers that we were given, and we just needed to put in the time and have the experiences from to come out and manifest in the way that they are right now. But Adam, how do you, in the work that you do, get people to think more like that? even as entrepreneurs or when they're at a company or you think there's just, you, you pick a lane. You're kind no, of- well, yes and no. I, well, first and foremost, I try to lead by example and to show, Hey, listen, I, I, by sharing my story, this is how I did it. This is what I went through. This was a breakdown that I had. I had to actually hit rock bottom. And I don't say to people, Hey, I suggest you hit rock bottom, but I showed this is my story and inspire them through it. But I do agree with you to a point that not everybody, it's kind of like the sexy buzzword of the last few years, entrepreneur. You want to have that in front of your title entrepreneur, founder, you know, you want that, but what does it really mean and what comes with it? How do you really earn that title? So I think that it's, it's really important to educate folks what goes into building your own thing, the trials, the tribulations, you know, putting yourself out there. What does it really mean, Kathleen, to eat what you kill? You and I don't eat unless we kill, right? We're solely responsible. We, you and I are solely responsible for the success or failure of our organizations. And if you can't carry that weight, then you should think twice about being an entrepreneur. I loved what you said before about the word breakdown, because I think that is something. That's next on my list. <laughs> You're leading me right into it. Like, so- I'm always beating the breakdown drum, but you know, breakdown start in our lives as- Little bees and big bees. Let's get into it. Bees. Yeah, but they, they really do. They start as these you know, individual, you'll find a few little protesters in your street, right? You're trying to drive Mm. somewhere and someone's got a little sign that says you might want to think about this or you might want to reconsider that. I like this analogy. Let's go with it. what I found is that over time, before you know it, you start ignoring that and you have this like hairy mob, you know, blocking the entire street. You can't drive anywhere. Everyone's pissed. Everyone's angry. You're scared to even be in the car. (laughs) right? Like this is how our life talks to us. Like breakdowns are meant to take down to the studs, burn to ash, destroy what is no longer for us. And so, so that we can build and architect, um, what is for us. And, And, you know, I think you're, you're, when you talk about definition of being an entrepreneur, I just think it's your, ability to withstand one breakdown after the next and keep going. Um, Because those breakdowns, when you can actually start to look at them with curiosity, and I've had so many this past year, you know, the the client relationship that goes sideways that otherwise Mm -hmm. would have normally worked, you know, the deal that you decide to walk away from that you worked on for six months, you name it, it's it's things are falling apart for a reason. And so what's the lesson here? And so being also able to not just stay in the game, but then redefine your path based on paying attention to where you're being guided. Like there's a very active element here of paying attention to the breakdowns and withstanding them. And then there's also this very passive, quiet listening to where and how you're being guided. And I don't think people spend enough time in the listening. It's all there. Guilty guilty as charged. And, you know, it's, uh, you go back, you're like, maybe I should have listened more to the situation, listen more to myself. And instead of living in that kind of woulda, shoulda, coulda, you know, think about what you could do in the present to, to, to make that change. And, and it's it, okay, Adam, cause if and, it's wrong for you, it's going to keep coming for you. you right. Realize and, that, right. And, like, and, and but you got to rec- pattern recognition. Right. Pattern, pattern recognition, I think, is another really critical skill set to have as an entrepreneur because you need to test things. You need to learn things. You need to not get complacent with trying doing the same thing every time and expecting the same results. Mm-hmm. That's the definition of insanity. Right. Like you have to be able to kind of break out of it and break away from yourself and try new things. And that's one of the things that I always do that I really try to put in the forefront every single day when I have my, my list, my tasks, the things I need to set out to accomplish for the day. Within each one of those tasks, Kathleen, I'm going to challenge myself at least once a day to do it differently. 
And that's something I'm very mindful of in the last two years. It could be something as simple as an email. If I'm going to follow up with a client on something that I'm waiting on, instead of kind of going to my default and being very super tactical on this one, instead of going to my default, like kind of in my head, my follow-up email message, just try something completely different that maybe I saw work for somebody else that they said on LinkedIn or somewhere else. Just see if that works. That's a great tip. I'm going to try that this week. Right? I love that. Or another... Or another one, which I read in a book, and, I, and, I, and I'm going to get killed here. I know who it is. It's Brian Wong, founder of Keep. I don't know if you know Brian. Good, good buddy. Um, he said to challenge yourself early on to get out of your comfort zone with its simple exercise. And I don't know if you would ever want to try this. You're in line at a Starbucks. Try to cut somebody in front of you and turn around and say to him, I'm really sorry. I have an emergency I got to run to. Would you mind if I cut in front of you? Just a micro push yourself out of your comfort zone to try something you normally wouldn't do. Like, it's not really a bad thing what you're doing. You're not like disrupting the entire universe, but something to try to help you get out of your comfort zone if that's a problem for you. So there's like little micro things you could try um, here and there. So I want to switch gears here and talk a little bit about personal branding and speaking. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong. You've been working with CAA for the last few years, correct? Yeah. Yep. Not multiple And how is how is the journey? Uh, how's he well congrats either way um talk about that like like have you always been able to shine on the big stage in front of lots of people or is that something you really was that like always your calling or is that something you really had to push yourself because you knew it was a path and you know maybe you were destined for it maybe you knew you always wanted that you know that that big x on the floor with the spotlight in front of thousands or is that something that you really had to you know work yourself into well, to your last point about putting yourself in your out, you know, pushing yourself and putting yourself out, outside of your comfort zone, I have subscribed to that for as long as I can remember. And the number one fear that I think most people still have to this day is actually a fear of public speaking. I could be wrong. <laughs> you probably oh, want big to time. Research that, uh, fact check that. Big time. It, it's at least top three, right? Fear of public speaking. And there is nothing more fear inducing than standing on a stage with thoughts that are your own (laughs) in your human form and just letting it rip, letting it be silent, letting no one clap, letting, you know, there just be stillness and that hangs in the air. And so that was, that was my goal initially was actually just to push myself into this space that I felt so wildly uncomfortable in And then what I found is once I started speaking and my first major speaking piece, I actually went, I flew myself and paid for my own ticket to fly all the way around the world to Dubai to do my first major public speaking event. Do what you got to do. I was not paid. There was no reason for me to be there. They had not invited me. You invested in yourself though. Myself, <laughs> into, but, but it's so extreme, you right? Did it. Like it illustrates the point of how crazy is that? That you're so wanting to push yourself, but also secretly so nervous you won't even do it within your own country. It, well, it's it's the two sides, right? Like your su- your subconscious, your subconscious is telling you to do it. It's pushing you to book the flights to do it. Like that drive is there, and then you're also balancing the other side. Like shit, I'm going to get up on this stage. Right in front of all these people, and to your point, say your words, like yeah. what you're feeling, yeah. your thoughts. You don't know how they're going to react, and, and that self affirmation. Am I saying something states. right? Am I yeah. going to be right? Am I going to be like applauded, or am I saying absolute garbage that no one wants to hear? Well, and you don't know. Muslim I mean, you have confidence. This was well, a that too. Country, talking about women's issues, so you have cultural and differences. Yeah, big and, time. And there were, you know, half of my presentation was actually rejected due to violations of Sharia law before I even yeah. got on stage. So well, that's a problem. Say, you know, I think, but, but through that, I found that I now love to be in spaces and places where there's a multiplier effect, right? I'm no longer in a position where I can do one-on-one mentoring anymore as much as I would love to do that. You know, I do it on a few case, case by case basis, right. but I'm, I'm looking for where are the places where I can go and connect with as many people in as short a short time as possible. That right? makes sense. Um, yeah. So then it becomes a beautiful vehicle when you look at it through that lens. Yeah, that's great. I want to double back here and talk about, you know, um, 
you know, females in brand marketing. In your opinion, you know, where are most brands missing the mark in catering or reaching, I don't want to use the word catering, in, in really truly reaching and speaking to, to, to female customers? You know, what's really the best way to, to help empower them? I mean, you're working with Fortune 100 brands. You know, where, the, where, they, where do you see the biggest problem and how they, what's the best plan of approach to really ensure that voices are being heard? My initial thought when I started the company was I was going to work only with endemically women-oriented brands. And what I found, which has been really nice, is there are actually a lot of general market brands that want to get this right. We realize that 80% of purchase decisions are made by women and, you know, they're a force even if they're not the primary consumer. You know, it's, it's, it's radically simple, Adam. It's just speaking to people like people. You know, shocker and having <laughs> the right talent, you know, you focus on talent, but having talent that is reflective of the end audience and consumer base you are looking to reach. It's not that complicated. And can we all fan out? Could I do a male Gillette razor ad? Of course, I'm sure if I studied the insights enough, right. but I don't know what it is to, to, take the stubble off my face. It's terrible. Thankfully, right? I don't know what that. I can't I can't get in the insight that is going to be real enough. And so have people working on your business that are ultimately the consumers and it the, sounds so simple. Reach, yeah, it sounds so simple. Speak to them like a friend as opposed to in this kind of aloof I'm here, you're here. We used to have that kind of you know, one direction sort of conversation and no That's one important. wants to be talked at any, you know, and, and you're going to lose if you're yeah, doing that. No. And, and some still are, but I think most are looking for this kind of two way participation, engagement conversation. Yeah, ab absolutely. That's fantastic. And I want to quote you where you say, quote, the future is all about seeing all groups represented as they exist in the world. Kathleen, how do, how do we how do we move towards that world? How do we get there? Do you remember that quote? <laughs> Sometimes I read, I read people's quotes. They're like, um, "Where the hell was that from? When did I? When, when did when did I say that? Where did you where did you pull that? Could you give me a That's source on that?" Good, but 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 I think look, we're living like media right now is so divisive. It's we become tribal when there's fear around resources when we're scared. Oh, for sure. Right? That's just we that's resort back to nature. our ancestral Neanderthalish tendencies, human tribal humanism. Mm -hmm. A hundred percent. And so this to me is, you know, what's going to unlock everything is a coming together of there is more love than there is hate in the world. And we need to start just having conversations again, as uncomfortable as they may be, we need to have those conversations, we need to get out of our echo chambers and kind of the silos that we live in and also know that what is being perpetuated, like, we are greater than that and we are better than that. And I think that's honestly what it's going to come down to so that everyone can be represented. Everyone can be part of the conversation. It's not an either or. And even in my work, it's like build like a woman. I just, I wanted to speak from the group that I'm a part of where I maybe didn't right. feel powered initially. And I felt, you know, I felt a lot of insecure in certain places it was never an anti any, it was never an anti. It's not, it's not, not supposed to be polarizing. It's not supposed to be polarizing. And I, but I realize that sometimes that that's even how it comes across. Well, that's, that's, just the, that's just the world that we're living in right now, where it's, where it's either right or left, black or white, down the middle. Like you can't just, you can't just be floating in the middle. You have to pick one side or another. And that, that's one of my, it eats my soul every single day that you can't just have your opinion. Like, why can't I be a little of this and some of that? Like, why do I have to be one extreme or another? And everyone's trying to put you into a bucket. Yeah. Why can't you talk about empowering women in the workforce? Why can't you talk about empowering women in media and not be labeled as, you know, uh, a hard, you know, a hard, you know, left feminist, like, or shit like that. Like you don't, why does it have to be like that when you're just trying to help and empower? Doesn't mean you're or for against for like, that's sorry. I just had a rant for a minute there. <laughs> My show, I could rant if I want, you right? Can so, rant if you want. right, but that's but that's really what it's about, and and you know I I hear you on that one. So let's let's bring it home here. Um, for me, this show is my masterclass. This is my you know my version. If I had to build a library of mentors, because I get to have amazing conversations with folks like yourself, who I admire and respect in this industry of greatly you know, amazing accomplishments and really set a, a, a shining example for everybody. 
men and women, you know, likewise. Kathleen, what is the single greatest piece of advice that you've ever received that you take action on every single day of your life? If you are this successful doing what you don't love, imagine how successful you'd be doing what you do love. So it's a return to love for me. And we all, even if you're in a line of work that you love, you can deviate off center. Mm. You can, you just keep deviating. And like a cruise ship, it's two degrees, three degrees, four Makes a big degrees. Difference, though. And before you know it, you're in a wildly different place. And so I just keep coming back to the work that I love on this planet for the, I remind myself how few years I have left. And so if I'm only here, God willing, for another 50 years, <laughs> I've got a lot of work to do and got a lot I to, to do. stay in a space, a space of love. So no, that's, that's a good one. also be more, the most successful. So no, that's Tamara Keeve. She's a Harvard trained lawyer turned coach. And that, that quote changed my life, got me to actually quit my job, but it's something that I keep front and center every day. That's a big one. And you know, it's kind of goes back to a little bit when people talk about like 1% better every single day. And I like the kind of analogy. If you do one degree, like before, you know, it, you'll be 180 degrees. Mm -hmm. you know, before you even change it. I haven't asked this question in a while. What would you say, Kathleen, is your superpower? What do you do better than almost anyone on this universe that makes you who you are? Wildly unreasonable. Meaning? I, if I think it's right, I will go after pretty much anything. And it's not being fearless. I'm actually terrified. <laughs> I'm doing it quaking in my boots. But I will, I will reach out to anyone. I will pitch anyone. I will send that email to anyone. I will get on a plane for 20 minutes with Warren Buffett to take him for an egg McMuffin sandwich and fly back for just 20 minutes. I, I have that in me. And I think that's, you know, when people who've worked with me and, have, you know, spend time with me, they say that's the main thing that they've walked away from, just these unreasonable asks. Because I really believe that one ask, one call can change the trajectory oh. of your whole life. Uh, absolutely. And that's, that's why I have the things in my life that I have. Truly, it was because I was unreasonable in what I believed was possible. And then you figure it out. <laughs> right. Did, did you take that flight with Warren Buffett? Did I miss that in the bio? No, but I did. I reached out to him. He politely declined. That was my <laughs> proposal to him. But we're connected. You know? and you, but, that, but that's the other thing, too, that people don't realize. Like Sometimes there's also a silver lining. If you take your shot and you miss, you still potentially have opened up a door to a relationship. And I always say it, too, like in sales, like I, I'll take a no over a no answer anytime because at least you're responding to me and engaging. No doesn't mean never. No doesn't mean never. No, it doesn't. And Kathleen, let's bring it home here. And, you know, a word I talk about on the show all the time is tenacity. And I, I feel it when we talk, I feel it in your background, your bio, everything that you do, you have that in spades. But if you look back on your life and maybe those times that were tough, those times that weren't easy and you might've been down and you had to pull yourself up and harness that tenacity to pull you forward and recognize it. And on the flip side, now you're sitting there in LA, life is looking good. You know, you're, you're, you're crushing it with Grace and co. Um, but you still need to keep yourself in focus. You still need to have your alignment, your compass. Kathleen Griffith, what is your focus in life? What is your North Star? North Star is just what lights my spirit on fire. That's how I'm able to stay tenacious because I only pursue at this point what truly speaks to my soul. And I don't spend a moment of my life doing anything else anymore. I love it. That's tremendous. Kathleen, I want to thank you so much for joining me. It's been a tremendous conversation. Uh, I think we shared a ton of wisdom about your early days in Adland. I love learning about Grace & Co., where it really came from. I think that's so important to have your foundation, your roots, and paying homage to your grandmother who left you with so much wisdom and what you're doing now to help empower women to be successful, helping brands recognize the true power of the female voice and just making the world a better place. And I wish you all the continued uh, success. I want everyone to check out uh, Grace 
Graceco, right? G-R-A-C-E-C-O.com to learn more. Kathleen, where could folks find you? Where could they connect with you? Where could they learn more? Buildlikeawoman.com, Graceco, G-R-A-Y-C-E-C-O.com. KathleenGraceGriffith.com. We'll link them all up. There's a lot. They're uh, not going to remember all these. It's a lot. But Adam, I just want to also say you transform the ultimate breakdown into something that is such a beautiful breakthrough. And so that, like everyone, this is a testament to also what is possible when you think you are dealt this awful hand. You've now built this company. You're teaching, doing what you love via this podcast you know, which is a platform that is meant to inspire people to keep going. That's what's possible when you, when you, you you know, take a different perspective. So thanks again. Thanks for having me. Hang with me one moment here and everybody listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it. It goes a long way. Leave a rating. Those ratings help. They, they really do. And I, I hate asking for it, but if you feel inclined, it goes a long way. You know where to find out more at the podcast.com. Follow us on all the social media channels. Remember, take care of each other. Look out for one another and catch us next week for another great episode of the podcast. Podcast. Jeez. Another great episode of the podcast. I've said that 193 times and that's the first time I got it wrong. Kathleen, you have that effect now. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Take care. Bye bye. Wisdom is forever, but for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode soon, jam-packed with more incredible humans. Thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing. To join the conversation, search The Pausecast on LinkedIn. And to catch up on past episodes and more info, please visit www.thepausecast.com.